Good morning. If you would, get a Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, we'll be spending all our time in that part of the Bible this morning. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to begin by reading just a little bit in Matthew 24, but we'll be spending the rest of our time in Matthew 25. So if you'd do well to have a Bible open to that place. Good to see you this morning. We have a number of visitors with us. We want you to know how much we appreciate you being here. We want you to feel welcome here. We want you to know that you honor us by being here and worshiping God with us. So if there's anything that we can do for you, any way that we can help you, anything you'd like to talk about or ask about, uh, anything about our service or any interest that you have, we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to just get to know you a little bit. But thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I want to begin by reading Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. These are the words of Jesus. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And I believe when Jesus says that day and hour, what he's talking about is the time when he will return, the second coming of Jesus. And that day and hour, that exact time, he says no one knows, not the angels, not the Son, but the Father only. We live between the two comings of Jesus, the time when Jesus was here with us on earth, and the time when Jesus has promised he will come back. We are between those two comings. And one of the things that is a, a universal biblical truth about the return of Jesus, that second coming, is that it's going to come at a time when no one knows. Jesus says here, no one knows that day or hour. And the picture that is very often used in the New Testament is the picture of a thief in the night. And so he uses that image in verse 43 of this text, Matthew 24 and verse 43, where he says, Know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Also, there is the image that's present in the New Testament that he also uses here of servants waiting for the return of their master. Their master goes away for a while, the servants are left in the house, and they await the return of the master. But they don't know when he's coming back. So, we are living like those servants. We are living like the people waiting for the thief. We don't know when, but we do know it's going to happen. And so, we are living in limbo. How do we do that? How is it that we live where we keep some future event in mind without really any clarity about when it's going to happen? What should our priorities be in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back and that we need to be prepared for the time when he comes back? In Matthew chapter 25, we have three stories where Jesus lays out priorities for this time of limbo, the waiting time. Now, a disclaimer before I get started, I am going to use the term limbo this morning. I do not mean the place that in Catholic teaching, unbaptized infants go to when they die. Limbo as a place, that's not what we're talking about. I'm using, if you're looking at dictionary.com, it's the third definition of limbo. The idea of an intermediate place, a place between two things. We're living between the two comings. So how do we live like that? How do we live waiting for something that hasn't yet happened and we don't know when it will happen? And so I want to look at how Jesus teaches us priorities for the limbo time in Matthew chapter 25. Let's begin just by reading Matthew 25. We're going to read through these stories and just briefly talk about each one. Matthew 25 and verse 1, the text says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So the first idea that Jesus gives about how we live in limbo is that it's going to require some foresight. And he talks about foresight by talking about a wedding. And the wedding has to do with certain virgins, these are bridesmaids, who are preparing for this, this marriage. In verse 1, it says, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So the customary style of weddings in Palestine in this time was that they were held in the evening, and the bridesmaids would come to meet the groom as he began to approach the home of the bride. And they would lead a procession 
to the home of the bride, which of course is the reason it's at night, why you need the lamps or the torches. They would lead him to the bride's house, they would get the bride, and then they would have a procession back to the groom's house, where they would have dancing or a party or a feast or something like that, which I think that's exactly the plan that Ryan and Allison have for their wedding, I think, right? No, this is the custom. So, so what's beginning here is the, the bridesmaids are waiting for the groom to come for the first time. They're waiting. And as they wait, they don't know exactly when he's going to come. So verse 2, five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So Jesus distinguishes between two types of bridesmaids, the wise and the foolish. And the difference is the wise ones are planning for an indefinite period of time of waiting. They've got extra oil because they know it may be a while before the groom comes. But the foolish ones have no foresight. They're not looking ahead to any of this. They just say, hey, it's time for the lamp thing. Let's get our lamps and go. And so they don't think ahead. Verse 5 says, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. That delay is the limbo time we're talking about. The time where we're not sure when he's going to come. We know he's coming, we're waiting for him, but we're not sure when. So there's a delay that's not explained why, and it doesn't really matter why in the context of the wedding, does it? It doesn't matter why the groom is delayed. What matters is the party can't start till the groom gets here, right? So in the same way, we're waiting for Jesus in this time where we're not sure when he's coming back, but we know he's coming, and it doesn't really matter why he's waiting. What matters is how are we going to act while we wait for him? So they sleep while they're waiting, It's not clear if their lamps are burning while they sleep, but I think they are because it wouldn't really make a lot of sense if they're not because they're going to run out of oil shortly. Verse 6, at midnight there was a cry, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. So now there's some sort of warning like, hey, it's about to happen. And so they get their lamps all ready. In verse 8, the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. So now the foolish bridesmaids realize their problem. They realize, oh no, I'm not ready for the thing I've been waiting for. I'm not prepared. I haven't had the foresight to get ready for this. Instead, I've sort of wasted all my waiting. And now I'm not prepared. So they go. When the groom comes, they're not there. And later on, they try to come after they've gotten more oil to come into the feast. And because they weren't there when the groom came, they're not let in. So Jesus says in verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So living in limbo requires foresight. Foresight. Looking ahead and preparing ourselves to wait. I don't just mean foresight in the sense that we're looking forward to the return of Jesus. That's certainly true. I mean in this text, it's about the foresight to be prepared to wait for an indefinite period of time. To wait a while. To wait so long that we might even die before he comes back. But we're prepared with the foresight to say, however long it takes, I will still be there. So foresight means that I'm going to wait for Jesus, but I'm going to continue to do the things that I'm supposed to do to handle my affairs. I'm going to continue to grow in Christ. I'm going to continue to serve other people, as we'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to do all the things that Jesus expects me to do while waiting for him. But I'm not going to lose the fact that it may be a while before he comes back, while at the same time not forgetting that fact either. I need both of those as I have foresight waiting for his return. Especially, it seems to me that foresight is about a mental and emotional battle. It's just really hard to wait for a long time for something that you don't know when it's going to happen. It's just natural, isn't it? That after a while you kind of get tired, and after a while you begin to say, well, you know what? I'm not sure, is this really going to happen? I've been waiting a long time. Especially as we go through more and more seasons of life. And we look back and we say, well, what am I waiting for anyway? And Peter talks about this in 2 Peter 3. Where he talks about how there is a a tapping into the emotional power of that questioning, that doubt. By some who say, where is the promise of his coming? And they say, all things continue as they've always been from the beginning of creation. In other words... What are you waiting on? Haven't haven't you been waiting long enough that you should have seen something? And they tap into that and try to get us to doubt. But foresight says, watch and wait and don't lose your steam. Don't be like those bridesmaids 
who waited but didn't have the plan of being able to wait however long it took. So I might die before Jesus comes back, but foresight says I'm going to wait as long as it takes. And we need that if we're going to continue to live in limbo. I believe that's what the parable of the ten virgins is teaching us. Let's read the next story in Matthew 25 and verse 14. Jesus says, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He would receive the five talents, went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. <clears throat> so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 24. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the limbo in this story is the time period between the master leaving and him coming back. That's the limbo, and that's the way this relates to what Jesus has been talking about, about being between the two comings. So, Jesus adds an extra element here that we're going to talk about stewardship, the idea that we are given charge over something. So, in Jesus' story, he talks about money and a master giving charge of certain amounts of money to the different men who are his servants. He distributes, in verse 15, each according to his ability. Five talents to one, two talents to one, one talent to one. Each according to his ability. Now, immediately, we need to say something about this text. Talent is not what we in English use the word talent to mean today. A talent was a weight of money. This is talking about money, and he gives them money. So, I tried to do a little figuring here. Uh, one scholar says that five talents is the equivalent of about 50,000 denarii, and... Two talents is 20,000 denarii, and one talent is 10,000 denarii. But since we don't really know what denarius looks like in our money, I just decided to kind of convert that. Which conservatively is something like this. Jesus' parable is, to one man, he gave $3.4 million. To another, he gave $1.3 million. And to another, he gave $650,000. I think that helps us. Because suddenly we say, oh, that's a lot of money. And so we see, well, what is he intending for them to do? So, verse 16 says, He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he had the two talents made two talents more. So there is an intensity to it. You see the urgency. He went immediately and begins to trade to try to make more money. He wants the master to make some money on his investment. He doesn't want that money to just sit there. He's going to help it grow. In verse 18 you have the other man, he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So we don't know what he's thinking yet, but we see he has a different approach than the other two. But we'll talk more about what he's thinking in a moment. Verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Notice the long time, after a long time. Because Jesus is saying, it may be a long time that you live in limbo. It may be a long time before I return. But that doesn't really change the expectations. Nor does it change the fact that I will come back, and that when I come back, as verse 19 says, I will settle accounts. This is an important idea in stewardship. Stewardship always has the idea that we are given something to manage for a while, but eventually the time comes when the one who owns the stuff comes back and says, now what did you do with what I gave you? There is an accounting that needs to take place. So verse 20 he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, 
saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he says the same thing to the man with two talents. He commends the servants. Did you notice the terms? He says you are good and faithful servants. Those are character statements. They are not statements of ability. He already knows their ability because he gave them money according to their ability. This is not about ability. This is about character. You are good and faithful. You are dependable. You are trustworthy. You have taken what's mine and you have been faithful to me and my wishes and how you used my money. So I will give you more. I'll make you ruler. I'll make you over other things. Enter into the joy of your master. Those are all sweet words for a servant. Then in verse 24, we see the other man, the man with one talent. Verse 24, he who also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Now here we see this man's heart. You see why he buried his portion of the money. And I believe we need to pay close attention here because this is the crux of the story. This is the point. The point of the story is just as the foolish virgins was the point of the last story, here you have an unflattering view of the master being the point of this story about stewardship. This man blames his inaction on his master. I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you haven't sown. So I was afraid. He is so afraid that he says, I'll just bury it. And when he comes back, I'll just give him what's his. You can't blame me. Don't get mad at me. I didn't give you more, but I surely didn't give you less. You have what's yours. I wonder if the man is just not interested in this whole prospect. I didn't ask for this money. I don't want to do anything with this. I don't want anything to do with it. I'll just bury it. It's a burden for me. It's a scary prospect. I have my own plans and goals I don't want to do with your stuff. But whatever it is, it is rooted in this view of the master that says, I don't want to be a steward for you. And I don't want anything to do with your gifts or your responsibilities. So verse 26, his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. See, the master disagrees. It's not about me, he says. It's you're wicked and lazy. You didn't want to do this. So don't blame it on me and act like I'm the problem. I'm so hard that you were scared of me. He says you're wicked and lazy. He says, you should have just given my money to the bankers and I could have gotten interest on it. He's saying, I don't really believe you because if you were really that afraid of me, you would have made more money out of your fear. This is not about me. This is about you and your refusal to be a good steward. So the master is scandalized. He, he says, you mean you didn't do anything? I gave you $650,000 and you buried it? And then you just brought it back to me as if that's all I wanted? Verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he, he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he has shown himself unworthy to have this money. It's taken away from him and given him to the, the man who's shown himself to be faithful because of his stewardship. Jesus is not afraid to redistribute his blessings to those who are going to use them in a way that honors him. And that's what's described in verse 29. So the servant proves himself to be unworthy. Now, I don't know about you, but verse 30 contains some chilling words. Do you remember at the end of the story of the virgins where they want to come in? And the statement is, the door is shut. Frightening words, chilling words. Here, the words are, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. The idea that we're talking about here is stewardship. So we have to ask the question, well, what does he mean by these sums of money? What is meant by the talents of money? And I believe this is what Jacob believes, so it can definitely be wrong. But I'm going to tell you what I think this means. 
I believe that the best way to understand the money here is to talk about the idea of opportunities. Blessings from God that present opportunities for us. Jesus gives each one of us opportunities based on our ability to do something with them. So that can involve money. He gives us money. He gives us relationships and connections. He gives us gifts. He gives us skills. He gives us time. He gives us health. Each one according to what we can do with it, based on the ability he knows that we have. So what I have and what you have are gifts from Jesus, expected to be used for Jesus, according to the ability, the things Jesus believes we can do with them. And the question of stewardship is, as I await the return of Jesus, what am I doing with everything he's given me? Yes, that involves money, but it involves far more than money. It is not just about being faithful in how we handle money. It is about being faithful in how we handle everything that we've been given, particularly the opportunities to use those to glorify him. This requires remembering that everything that we have, we're going to give an account for. And that is a concerning and alarming prospect, that I'm going to give an account for this. The worst problem in this story is just not using the things that we've been given. Burying them like that one talent man. Just saying this is not something that I'm going to use in any way. Jesus expects us to maximize the things we've been given. To maximize our sphere of influence and our gifts. To teach with all our hearts and guide our children and show our awareness of the master. Living in gratitude to him. All of that is a part of taking what's been given to me and using it for him. Knowing he's going to come back and ask me. What did you do with what I gave you? But it appears to me, I'll just speak for Jacob. From my life. The greatest danger in view of this story for me is that I would take everything that's been given to me and just assume that what God wants is for me to use this for me. To enjoy my life, to have good things that I use for me, and at the end of it all, just say, well, that was a nice life. Jesus expects us as stewards to use those things for him, not just for ourselves. To me, that mentality that it's just for me is even worse than just burying it in the sand. Because at least the man who buries it in the sand can present it back to him. When I use it all for myself, I have nothing to give back. I have nothing to say, this is what I did with it. And so for me, it is a wake-up call to ask the question, what am I doing with these things, this money, this time, these gifts, these relationships? Not just am I enjoying them. That's how we live in limbo, to look forward to the fact that, that there will be an account for what we're doing. Because Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he tells us clearly, I'm going to ask you to give an account for what you've done with my things. And the final story, let's look at that in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31, the text says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. They will answer also, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This text, this story, teaches us that living in limbo requires selflessness. That Jesus wants us to focus on someone besides ourselves as we wait for his return. 
It's hard to say whether we're really talking about a parable here or a clear statement of judgment. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. It starts with that simple statement, When He comes back, He'll sit on His throne. But it also talks about people as sheep and goats, which we know people are not sheep and goats. Okay, right? Do I need to prove that? People are not sheep and goats. And uh, it also talks about just one aspect of judgment instead of the full gamut of things that we are told are going to come out in the day of judgment. So it's hard to say which one it is, but in our context, it's that same idea, isn't it? When Jesus comes back, when the, the king returns, when he comes in his glory and sits on his throne, the limbo will be over, and the question will be, what matters then about what's happening now? So verse 32 says, Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Separation. This is a judgment where we decide where everyone goes. Who is who? And out of the great mass of people, sheep and goats are separated. Palestinian she shepherds would normally separate sheep from goats at night because goats needed to be warm and sheep preferred to sleep in the open. Somehow, something about their wool kept them warm. I don't know. Sheep would sleep in the open, goats would sleep uh, needing to be somewhere warmer. So there was a separation, and that's what Jesus describes here, a separation where all the people are no longer all the people, they're put into two groups. And the basis for this, verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. So these are all acts of sacrificial selflessness. That is, someone's hungry or thirsty and we give and we share and we go seek them out. We visit them. We take care of them. He says later we minister to them. And the people are, are confused, these people who are the sheep, because they don't understand when this happened. Verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When? And verse 40 he says, the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When you serve the king's brothers, you serve the king. They did not realize it when they were doing it. They don't even remember doing it. But now he says, you did it to them and you did it to me. Things done while waiting for the king affect what happens when the king comes. Things done while waiting for the king affect what happens when the king comes. So what we do right now in the limbo time matters to Jesus. And Jesus says in this text clearly that it will determine our fate when he returns. I do not know how he could be stronger about it than to say what he says in this text. And then, of course, the goats. Verse 41. The goats are cast into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Because they are the opposite. In verse 42, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. They did not help. They did not meet needs. And when they neglected their fellow man, they neglected Jesus. They neglected the king. Verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It matters to Jesus what happens while we await his return. It matters deeply to him how we treat his people while we live in limbo. Selflessness is the issue here. Selflessness. I wonder why the goats didn't meet those needs. Obviously, they knew about them. I wonder if they were crazy busy. I wonder if they thought, well, somebody else will take care of that. I wonder if they thought that those people were not really deserving. You know, they should get a job, they should work harder. I wonder if they thought somebody else probably has a responsibility. Or what, where's your family? I wonder if they thought this is just too inconvenient. I wonder if they turn their pockets out and say, you know, I don't have anything else this month. I wonder. But whatever it was, they did not realize that in neglecting these people, they were neglecting Jesus. That's the connection Jesus makes. And he wants us to make that when we serve one another, we're serving him. And that will matter when he returns. 
So while we're in limbo, we need to choose selfless living. Living that thinks of other people first. Living that meets needs when it inconveniences us or not. Living that gets inside the heads of other people to try to figure out how can I help, what can I do? What are they struggling with and where can I meet them in that need? Selfless living that remembers how lonely it can be when we get sick, when we lose someone we care about. Selfless living that remembers what it feels like to be a stranger in a new place and that reaches out to include. Selfless living that remembers how desperate we can feel when we have needs nobody can help us with and when compassion can help. This is what Jesus wants us to be doing while we wait for his return. This is it. Yes, we need to be thinking and looking ahead to be prepared to wait. And yes, we need to be doing what we can with the things we've been given. But here he says, you need to be serving. Be busy helping my people. I don't know about you, but very often I get wrapped up in my own stuff. My own plans, my own thoughts, my own concerns, my hopes and dreams, my own little world. Very often to the point of inaction. Very often to the point of negativity. But when I can break out of that bubble and do for other people, it changes me. It makes me remember that I'm not the center of the universe. It makes me remember that there are things to be done and people with needs and a world outside that needs my service because it needs my Lord. If we're really focused on the return of Jesus, we'll turn our attention to one another. That's the point. As you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So I want to remind you that we are in a unique position between two comings. That Jesus is coming back and that gives us some urgency and some passion and some focus. Because we want to be ready when he comes back. But we don't know when. Which also means that we have to prepare for this life as long as it takes for him to come back. And that makes me wonder, as I thought about this this week, what if that's the point? What if the point is that Jesus always wants and always has wanted us to live with that level of urgency? All generations of disciples, all of them, since the time when he came to the time when he comes back, to all live with that sense that his return is imminent, that the end is near, because that changes us for the better. Isn't that a better person to live with? Doesn't that make us better to have foresight, to be stewards, and to be selfless? What if the feeling that we have all the time in the world really makes us lazy and short-sighted and selfish? What if living in limbo really is what's best for us and what's best for the world? So I leave those things for you to think about. And I ask that God will bless us to live well in limbo, to think seriously about Jesus' return, and to live better because of it. There might be someone here this morning who needs to respond to the gospel, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and that each one of us who belong to him have accepted that sacrifice that he offered for us, received it by faith, turning from our sins, being baptized in him. And if you're ready to take that step and accept that sacrifice, to become a disciple of Jesus, a follower who awaits his return so someday we can live with him forever, we want nothing more than for you to take that step this morning. If you're ready this morning to become a Christian, to be baptized into Christ, or if there's any need that we can help you with, please come to the front right now as we stand and sing.